The 28th of June, 2019. What is left of the Morandi Bridge crashes to the ground in a meticulously planned explosion. There is no celebration, just sadness. This is a bridge that killed 43 people and destroyed hundreds of lives in one of the most absurd infrastructure catastrophes of all time. The bridge that was once the gateway to Europe and the Mediterranean for millions of people is no more. The death knell for the Morandi Bridge in Genoa had rung out at 11.46 a.m., just nine and a half months earlier. Genoa, Italy. It is August the 14th, the day before Italy's biggest summer holiday. The towering concrete icon of the Morandi Bridge collapses into a jagged heap. Trucks and cars shoot into the void and plunge to the riverbed 50 meters below. People working under the bridge are crushed. 43 people lie dead in their vehicles or under the rubble. Suddenly I found myself plummeting together with the whole bridge, with the front of my car pointing downwards. I instinctively took my hands off the wheel and put them behind my head. I thought I was dead. Suddenly I hear a loud noise. I was looking at my tablet and I hear my colleague Luigi shout, What the f*** is going on? I look up and it was just like in the films. There were cracks in the road and we fall down. The collapse of the Morandi Bridge, Genoa's very own Brooklyn Bridge, is the worst road disaster ever to befall Italy. The mountain of twisted metal and crushed concrete left behind became a symbol of both human achievement and failure. What exactly went wrong that day and triggered the sequence of events that brought down the Morandi Bridge may never be known. But a fault in the original design and delayed repair work almost certainly contributed significantly to the disaster. It's the morning of the 14th of August, 2018, 51 years after the Morandi Bridge in Genoa was opened. Torrential rain pours onto the vehicles as the cell phone of this truck driver records. He is on his way to France and filming the thunderstorm. Filmed in the other direction is CCTV footage of the motorway company. They both identify the green Basco truck and a grey Volkswagen Tiguan overtaking it. They both record the last living moments of 43 people and the final few seconds of the 50-year-old Morandi Bridge. Davide Capello is at the wheel of the Tiguan. This is the first time he has seen this video. He sees his own car just a few seconds before the disaster. I got into the left lane because I had to go towards Genoa West and I overtook a number of cars. When I get to the point of the famous ninth pylon, I hear a dull rumble that surrounds me. I begin to see dust falling from above, small debris, and I look in front of me and see the road undulating and a semicircular gap opens up 15 meters ahead of me, 10, 15 meters. Una voragine semicircolare davanti a circa 15 metri da me, 10 metri. Oddio! Oddio! Mi ricordo sempre di di una macchina che I remember a car that fell down like this and I witnessed the whole scene without being able to do anything. 
I instinctively took my hands off the wheel and put them behind my head. I thought I was dead. I knew immediately what was happening, because in any case, I saw the bridge collapse, the tarmac fall down, the cars disappear into the void. So I realized from the outset that it was the bridge that was collapsing. Gianluca Ardini and his colleague were delivering furniture when they flew off the bridge in their white truck. When I realized where I am, I turned towards Luigi, whose head is on the steering wheel. I try to touch him with my left arm, but it doesn't seem like an arm at all, so I touch him with my right hand, and he shows no sign of life, so I realize he's dead. Beneath the bridge, workers from the local waste recycling company witness the bridge fall onto colleagues. They cannot know what is happening or the extent of the disaster. As the bridge collapses, drivers slam on their brakes. Dozens of cars in front of them plunge into the void. The rain is still torrential. In the meantime, police and firemen begin rushing to the scene. The first to arrive face a grim scene of death and destruction. Richard Bordoni is a British-born Italian firefighter. He was on duty in the Pavia fire station and is the leader of an urban search and rescue team. There was a thunderstorm, a severe weather. There was a thunderstorm and we saw that a huge span of the bridge was missing. Even if uh, I didn't, we didn't figure out you know, how severe the damage was and we didn't even know how many vehicles or were involved in it. What I saw was those huge uh, concrete blocks, huge, uh, there were massive uh, reinforced concrete blocks were part of the uh, part of the pier that had just collapsed with the stays. All I could see was darkness and I could smell the dust. I tried to take my seatbelt off to try to understand where I really was, where I had been stopped. So I took a look out of the car's rear window pane that had broken and all I could see was debris, dust. There was no one there. When I realized where I am, I tried to look out of what was left of my window, and I realized that I was more or less 10 meters off the ground. I thought to myself, damn, I've survived and now I'm going to fall further. And the truck was moving. I panicked because I couldn't feel my legs and I thought I'd been paralysed. But I could sort of feel them, so I thought, maybe I've just broken my back. I began crying and I said to myself, hey Dan, calm down. You've got to calm down till they get you down. It was wet. It was still wet. It just finished raining. There was a lot of dust because of a huge uh, dust cloud. Um, there were some people still uh, moaning or complaining, asking for help. and. We had rescue workers, firefighters working on them and rescuing them, supporting the ambulance service too. And after it was just machinery, our machinery working on, on the top of the rubble. Are you declaring an emergency, sir? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Era un silenzio quasi. An unnatural silence. The first time I looked out, I could only see rubble. Nothing was moving. It was as silent as a grave. The urban search and rescue teams of Italy's fire brigade have swung into action in all of Italy's great natural disasters. These men and women have no time to be shocked. 
they have a protocol to follow. And on the Mirandi Bridge on the 14th of August 2018, it was particularly challenging. Our capability and capacity is uh, breaching and breaking concrete. We are capable of doing that. We usually work on uh, standard structures or high-rise buildings or uh, stone-made buildings. We are capable of um, uh, breaking and breaching through floors and walls. Um, what we are not used to and we have never tested is breaching through uh, so overwhelming pieces of concrete. So we knew we needed extra resources to do this job. As the rain cleared up, the extent of the disaster became apparent. As soon as the command post was set up, one of the first job uh, is tactical and strategical planning. And one of the, in, the most important pieces of information that you need is how many people are, are missing, how many people you have to rescue. Uh, to get this information, it's very, very difficult. I mean, that road is the motorway. It's a major motorway. It's called the A10. It's also used as a ring road by the locals and it connects the western area of Genoa to the eastern area where the port is. So a lot of uh, lorries, lots of heavy vehicles, lots of goods, also dangerous goods and a lot of holiday makers. Within minutes, hundreds of firefighters and civil defence operatives began reaching the disaster scene. Isolated and confused, Davide Capello did not know that a whole span of the bridge had collapsed. I called my girlfriend, who at first didn't answer, so I called my dad. I spoke to him and told him where I was and what had happened. He was silent. He didn't quite realise. We had to uh, find out where we could work safely and where there was less risk and where we could find cars and vehicles where we're looking for the entrapped persons. We didn't want to breach through rubble. Uh, the, what we were looking for was the missing. The strongest emotions I felt were for my girlfriend who was pregnant and Pietro was born a month later. I had to stay alive at all costs to be able to see my son. I think that was the strongest feeling I had at that time, but obviously you think of many things, such as your family, but that's the main thing. We were working uh, with the police uh, law enforcement, all the police forces uh, involved in the rescue operations, because we, we needed to know how many people were reported missing and also looking at CCTV images, uh, we tried to find out how many uh, vehicles were involved, not only cars, but also heavy goods uh, vehicles or lorries. Dangling in separate cars at opposite ends of the collapsed bridge, Davide Capello and Gianluca Ardini both realized where they were, but were still at great risk and exposed to falling debris. Ardini had life-threatening injuries. When I heard the first helicopters, the first sirens, I calmed down. And in those moments, those hours, because I was there for four hours, they told me four hours. That seemed three days to me, the longest hours of my life. They had to stabilise the truck because it could have fallen further, and in the meantime I had changed position. I'd been able to take off my seatbelt because I had a broken pelvis and it hurt badly. And I lay down near the pedals because the truck was head down. So I managed to lay down there and every now and again I had to move. But they shouted, keep still, keep still. The great fear I had was that my car could fall further down. But in actual fact, it was almost parked inside a space in that span of the motorway that turned over as it collapsed, and I ended up inside, almost parked inside. And that protected me from the collapse of anything else. Within a few hours of the bridge collapse, 
The main road arteries along the river were blocked off and crowded with emergency services, now working around the clock to account for every single missing person. We were carrying out search and rescue with canine units and trying to find them under the rubble. Uh, so that's part of the use our work to find people under the rubble using canines, so that's dog search, and also using electronic devices. That means listening devices, so we can hear if anybody's alive under the rubble and search cameras too. We're using infrared cameras and search cameras to um, look through the rubble and see if we can find anybody under there. Comunque cercavo di dare indizi per, per farmi trovare. I tried to help them find me. First, since I had a pain in my pelvis, I took my seatbelt off and got into a position where I could keep more still, because the truck was moving a lot and there was a risk it could fall further. I cooperated quite a lot with the firemen because I wanted to get out at any cost. Using just the right arm, I was able to sit astride the window and they got me down. I think I couldn't have avoided it. I think that was my destiny. I don't have any other explanation. I think I had to be at that place at that time, but that my time had not come yet. Those living in the homes below were also confused and terrified. I heard this enormous clap of thunder because I immediately thought it was thunder. The pavement began trembling so I thought the lightning had struck the ground. Hard, very hard. I went into the big door and I went back home. I heard screaming. I heard the people of the upper floor screaming. And I thought, how silly, it's over, it's just thunder. I heard my daughter screaming on the staircase. I reached her and she said, Mum, let's get out. The bridge has collapsed. More than 600 people were evacuated from the surrounding neighbourhood as the threatening remnants of what was once an engineering marvel teetered dangerously over their homes. I went into the apartment, got my cat straight away and looked from the terrace of the house to see if it really was the bridge, because it was something that we never thought. It was unthinkable that the bridge could collapse. I saw the spans. I didn't wait around. I didn't see trucks. I didn't see anything. I just saw this missing piece. What had happened to the brilliant bridge built by engineer Riccardo Morandi? The stay bridge he designed was solid, elegant and inexpensive and built without destroying the homes below. Michele Calvi is a professor of civil engineering and a well-known expert on building safety. He has studied the catastrophe as an independent expert. Morandi took as his remit the fact that he had to interact as little as possible with the buildings below the bridge. That was the goal. Even just the fact that the 36 meter supporting beams, the ones resting on the pylons, were built using prefabricated beams that were set in position using cranes. So working only from above the platform is proof of the situation. Additional to this is that the platform was built using molds that were five or five and a half meters long, and working on top of the platform, what we would call today a segmented construction, which at the time was an unknown and non-standard technique. The Morandi Bridge was a cable stay design. Unlike suspension bridges that hang from cables attached to anchors at each end of the bridge, stay cable structures use thick cables set astride a saddle on top of a concrete tower to actually hold up the road itself, creating a fan-like support structure. Obviously, today, a stay bridge is a bridge with a large redundancy factor. Today, if one or two cables are cut, 
The bridge doesn't collapse. In fact, almost nothing happens. That bridge, on the other hand, if you remove one of the stays, obviously collapses. Everyone says that. Not only after the events, but any sensible engineer, if asked, would the bridge stand if one stay were missing? Obviously, they'd say no. So that was a bridge with little redundancy. The city of Genoa occupies a narrow stretch of land between the sea and the mountains. The two ports here are vital hubs for international trade and travel. Before it was demolished, this was all that was left of one of the primary infrastructure links between the north and west of Europe and the whole of the Mediterranean basin. The Mirandi Bridge was built in a strategic position within the city of Genoa, but it was also in an incredibly inaccessible place. A little more than a kilometre long, it crossed the Polcevera Valley, a river, a railway depot, a densely populated area and several large factories at an average height of 45 metres above the ground. The container port to the west was connected to the rest of Italy over the same bridge. The construction design, based on dozens of strands encased in concrete and attached to tall A-shaped pylons, was revolutionary for its time. He uses a large number of strands to connect the platforms that had already been built to keep the platforms suspended. Then he connects the stay, which is in compressed concrete, and as loads are applied, the concrete is decompressed, so that with the same loads, the stay movement is much smaller. Smaller movements mean greater stability in the platforms, reducing fatigue, so the structure is more healthy. And from this point of view and from the conceptual standpoint, I'd say there's nothing wrong with this solution. When the stays were examined 30 years later, the steel strands on the easternmost platform were found to be corroded through 30% of their width, so the stays were replaced with new steel strands. The concrete had not been fully injected, leaving cavities around the steel cables. Professor of Civil Engineering Michele Calvi has run complex computer models to come up with some surprising insights into the real state of the bridge. The fact that those stays were not injected was a known fact. If you go and see the pictures dating back to the 1990s, where they looked, there was no trace, or a tiny trace of injection. Can this have had an effect on the bridge? As a direct cause of the collapse, I would say no. But that it could have contributed generally, or more specifically, locally to corrosion, I'd say yes. Engineers reviewing the safety of the structure at the time did not suggest the bridge was dangerous or at imminent risk of collapse. Da quello che si legge negli articoli degli anni 90, uh, si legge che la corrosione... From what we read in articles of the 1990s, that the corrosion was far more advanced in this particular structural element, while in the others it was far less advanced, and we read that they carried out a number of mathematical models that are not specified in the reports of the time, and we read that serious problems with the other two structures would occur several decades later, and there was no urgent need to intervene. Until its collapse, 3,000 lorries drove over this bridge each day, transporting goods as far as to and from Portugal, Spain and France. Two and a half million containers are unloaded at the two main port terminals. More than four million people board cruise ships or ferries in Genoa each year as well. The bridge was a gateway to Europe and beyond for goods and people. And yet the need for critical repairs was no secret. Eventually, plans for a new bridge were shelved and the privately owned Autostrade per l'Italia 
proposed changing the stays. The date set was two months after the collapse. The weakness of the bridge lay on the lack of redundancy in the stays, but for the most part, it was solid and stable. The fact that the whole bridge collapsed is certainly connected to the fact that the bridge has little redundancy. It's almost rigid. If one element disappears, the whole bridge ceases to work. This doesn't mean that any local item can cause the whole bridge to collapse. So we asked ourselves if a massive impact on a part of the platform might bring about an overall collapse. But from our models, we see that this would not have brought about the collapse of the whole bridge. So, according to engineer Michele Calvi, it could not have been the weight of traffic to have caused the disaster. The bridge was, in fact, hollow between the road surface and its base. Il, um the road segment in front of me is built on two levels and between these two levels is a space and I ended up inside as the segment was turning over. I went right in there. There was huge voids, even if uh, one huge section of the bridge, it was the deck of the bridge, uh, basically overturned and some cars were there, um, some other vehicles too. They were also squashed. Uh, some were underneath the rubble, but the majority were basically on top. We did have to remove a lot of rubble to find other cars, but unfortunately we didn't find any live people inside. These publicly available CCTV images of the bridge just before it collapses show the traffic is regular and continues until the red brake lights begin showing the cars stopping short of the giant gap. As the rain fell, so did the reinforced concrete. This CCTV film from the local waste recycling centre below shows men passing by just before the concrete begins to crash into the plant. A lucky cat survives. A few minutes later, the torrential rain stopped and only rubble remained. By noon on the 14th of August 2018, the Fire Brigade Urban Search and Rescue teams were picking through the rubble of the collapsed Morandi Bridge, searching for survivors. Just two of the people who fell from the top of the bridge made it out alive. The teams first had to identify who they were looking for and then find them. Well, like any kind of major incident, uh, anybody involved is part of the rescue uh, efforts. And uh, well, as soon as a lot of the uh, specialized team came in from all the agencies, not only from the fire service, from the bystanders, we got the information basically. They weren't supporting us, rescuers, rescuing people. They were, we were gathering information from there to find out uh, what they saw and we wanted to know how many people were involved in this collapse. The list of missing people reached nearly a hundred as people called the toll-free line in search of their loved ones. But as time passed, either they were accounted for and found alive, mostly elsewhere, or they were identified among the victims. The forensic police were on the scene to identify body parts and DNA. We didn't have a clue how many vehicles were on top. You could just see the scenario. You could count the vehicles on the riverbed or where they fell. And so uh, we started working on um, checking CCT footage. There was a toll-free number which was uh, activated for reporting missing people. And what happens is after a few hours, we had um, a number of roughly 40 persons missing from uh, involved. And after a few hours during the night, that figure just went up to 80, 100. As the urban search and rescue teams plowed through the remains of the bridge, family members endured a desperate wait for news of their loved ones. One woman flew in all the way from Jamaica. 
Well, the, the one that really touched me was getting, uh, was talking to the relatives of the Jamaican uh, uh, family. We didn't expect it. We had the Red Cross coming in, a psychological support unit. Um, they wanted to talk to the commander in charge of the rescue effort because she was begging the rescue service to do all they could to rescue their relatives. The first thing I asked is, I know, what, did, what have you been told? What do you know? And um, well, she had in the back of her mind uh, this thought of finding them still alive, even if she knew uh, they weren't. In the meantime, the investigation was underway. Although Michele Calvi was called by families of the victims to provide expert testimony in the investigation, he preferred to remain neutral and investigate for himself. We used a particularly advanced model that allowed us to simulate what happens to the bridge with parts moving long distances, so simulating the collapse up to its conclusion. This model allowed us to understand where the parts of the bridge ended up on the ground. So this model was fundamental. But I would never have trusted this model if we hadn't used the traditional methods and other approaches that I have just touched on, and had I not seen that the results were coherent amongst themselves. His conclusions are surprising. And despite the various theories presented in the courts and in the media, he sustains that the Morandi Bridge was solid. An increase in corrosion alone would not have caused an overall collapse without showing signs that it was about to happen. It could be the collapse of a stay due to problems at the connection with the platform or above at the connection with the top of the pylon. After that, the other events are consequential. So the collapse of the platform through breakage and torsion is connected to this. The engineering of the bridge was such that even if the cables were corroded, the effect would simply to have been the extension of the stays, as the pre-tensioned concrete would have been decompressed. With corrosion of up to 60% of the cables, the bridge would have sunk by 40 centimetres, an event that would have been noticed by the workers on the bridge that day or by anyone passing by. Analysis of photographs of the rubble have led Michele Calvi to conclude that only a catastrophic collapse of one of the connections of the stays would have produced a pattern of debris like the one that was found. Using this kind of modeling, we find the distribution of debris on the ground that is very similar to the distribution of debris that we see in the photographs available. So as a result, I could conclude that for some reason, in my opinion, one of the stays gave way. And in particular, in my opinion, it was the southwestern stay. The collapsing bridge threw dozens of vehicles into the void, crashing into the ground below. Those involved fell off a bridge and fell between 40 and 50 meters. It was a huge drop. So the cars were, or they crashed through the riverbed or on top of other buildings, or were crushed by the huge blocks of concrete. So that was the major cause of death. Down in the valley, Richard Bordoni and the USAR teams reduced the number of missing people, dead and alive, down to three. They pored over CCTV images from the highway to determine how many cars might have been on the bridge when it fell. One car was missing, and they found it on the fifth day. Aboard were Christian Cecala, his wife, Donna, and their nine-year-old daughter, Cristal. The last car was a Hyundai i20 LPG car. The first part of this car was found in the air, basically stamped onto the concrete. It was the back panel, seat panel. And so we sent some colleagues underneath uh, from the bottom. So we opened up another hole at the bottom of the rubble and we basically found an engine. 
The experience that each USAR member has gained while working in confined spaces proved key in identifying the vehicle. And using his uh, a camera, he took a picture and managed to take note of the uh, uh, registration of the, of the frame. And with this number, we had the confirmation that it was a Hyundai, a Hyundai i20 LPG, and uh, that's what we were looking for. The family of three was the last to be found. They had been on their way to their holidays. We knew we were looking for a family, um, a family of three, that's two adults and uh, their daughter, a nine-year-old daughter. And that was the last one and we were working, all our efforts were concentrated on that one because we knew that on that car there were three persons on board. Other victims of the tragedy included cameraman and journalist Gianni Battiloro, who was travelling with friends Matteo Bertonati, Gerardo Esposito and Antonio Stanzione. Andrea Vittone, Claudia Possetti and their two children from Pinerolo, Piedmont, were also killed. The Robbiano family was wiped out. Father Roberto and his wife Ercilia died together with their eight-year-old child. Another 30 also died on that day. fatto 55 giorni, mi sembra 58 giorni in ospedale e ho fatto fisioterapia tuttora la faccio. I spent 58 days in the hospital and did physiotherapy and I'm still doing it to regain the use of my arm. As for injuries, I injured my retina, my arm, my pectoral muscles with deep cuts made by the seat belt. I broke my arm my elbow, my ribs, pelvis in two places, a vertebra. It changed me psychologically a lot. I'm certainly not the same man I was. Psychologically, mi ha cambiato tanto, perché comunque non sono quello di prima, sicuramente. Ma io non ho riportato grosse lesioni nel I didn't suffer serious injuries. Mainly, a few vertebrae were compressed during the impact. I have shoulder problems, but given the fall and everything that happened, it's almost nothing. Several workers at the waste recycling plant were buried by tons of reinforced concrete that fell from 50 meters. Their colleagues raised the alarm. We had one colleague of one of the um, missing, which had started his first day of work at the waste factory. And he reported that he was sure that his colleague was there under the rubble somewhere because he started his job in the morning and then he, they couldn't get in touch with him. So they were telling us to find him and was most probably involved in the, in the, under the collapse uh, near the parking area of the um, waste collection company. We can call it anything we like. Luck? I'd say the word miracle is inappropriate because it's unfair towards those who didn't share my fate. But it's unexplainable. We started on Tuesday the 14th and it was Saturday morning when uh, we found the last uh, deceased person and we were sure, 100% sure, that nobody else was involved in the, in the collapse. The city of Genoa, home to more than half a million people, was also left struggling by the collapse of its iconic Morandi Bridge. The tragedy left 43 dead and shocked Italians, who began to ask just how safe the rest of the nation's aging highway infrastructure really was. And why hadn't all the stays been repaired when they were found to be corroded? Non voglio fare il 
il procuratore della Repubblica che dice che la gente dovrà pensarci. I don't want to usurp the role of the prosecutor who says that someone should have known. But I can say that massive work was done in the 1990s on one of the pylons and nothing else was done afterwards. And that is very strange because the three systems are very similar if not identical. And the fact that corrosion was already identified as a problem, even if I say it wasn't the main and fundamental cause of the collapse, this does not excuse the fact that the structures were monitored ineffectively. The city's head prosecutor was now able to visit the site and begin trying to understand what had gone wrong. The investigation got underway and vital footage was gathered from CCTV cameras, including some still secret footage taken from the bridge itself. The city remained cut in two, causing untold damage to its finances. Who was responsible? According to Michele Calvi, there was no forewarning of catastrophic collapse. If someone had asked me about the bridge a month before, two months before, three months before, would I have had it closed? Don't think this is an easy question. I've had bridges closed. I've had stretches of road closed. So the question is, would I have had the bridge closed? I would not have closed it. I don't have any doubt about that. There was a plan to reinforce it that had been through several commissions. If I had been on those commissions and seen those plans, would I have had the bridge closed? Frankly, I don't think so. I think I would have done everything to accelerate the process of reinforcement, but I don't think I'd have had the bridge closed. Whatever or whoever was responsible for the deaths of 43 people under the rubble of the Mirandi Bridge remains to be determined by the courts in legal and criminal proceedings likely to drag on for decades. Davide Capello remains in shock. Il pensiero di, di quel giorno lo vivo quotidianamente. I relive that day every day. It's not something you can forget, so now and again I have a nightmare. You get these sensations unexpectedly during the day, so it's something that has marked me for life. I take medication, I go to the psychologist, and I hope that over time, although I'll never forget, Maybe I'll learn to live with it. Like many engineering disasters of national significance, the Mirandi Bridge catastrophe has left a wake of mistrust in the nation's institutions, especially in the infrastructures that have not been overhauled since the booming 1990s. There is a general infrastructure issue in Italy, in France, in Germany, and everywhere. It is not a problem we can go on hiding. It is such a huge problem that it requires an approach that is different from the usual approach. We can't simply do spot checks and decide to intervene on this bridge or that bridge. In my opinion, we need to proceed if I may say this, by filters. So if we have 20,000 bridges or 30,000 bridges, we need to do an initial selection of bridges that certainly present high risks and then fix those and leave aside those that can be dealt with in 50 years. Not only are Europe's infrastructures aging, but there is also evidence showing that structural integrity reports may have been falsified by the private motorway franchise holders in Italy to avoid the cost of repair and upgrading. When you get on the road, you can't be afraid that the road will collapse under your car. 
you have to be afraid of getting distracted, of having an accident. Not that the tarmac under your wheels disappears. This is impossible. It just can't happen. The city of Genoa has blown up the remains of the Morandi Bridge once and for all. Hundreds of people have been moved into temporary accommodation and the whole city is paying the price of losing its strategic place among Europe's commercial hubs. More than a year went by before work on erecting the pylons for a new bridge finally began. They should have reopened the bridge three months after the collapse. Three months after the collapse. Because opening the bridge, in my opinion, was more important than anything else. So don't tell me it has to be beautiful and so forth. That bridge had a structure that was still standing for the most part and maintaining the basic safety standards. They could have immediately begun planning. There are such things as Bailey bridges, bridges that can be built in three days. Julius Caesar tells us that he built a bridge on the Rhine in a few days, and we still have the construction plans, and we take two years to do the same thing. I think it's ridiculous. The pylons of the original Morandi Bridge were blown up on the 24th of June 2019, 10 months after the catastrophic collapse of two spans of the bridge. It was a milestone in the building of the new, equally iconic bridge designed by famed Genoese architect Renzo Piano. The plan to give Genoa a new bridge to keep its port relevant to international trade and keep traffic flowing from east to west and north to south got off to a very slow start. With the storms of political crisis rumbling in the background, the decaying infrastructures in Italy and Europe were once again forgotten, shut away until the next catastrophe crashes into the headlines.